Welcome back, everyone. We're the Lorcana Twins, and we're here to dive a little deeper into our theory about the symbol that is found around the cost indicator on the cards in the Disney Lorcana TCG, as well as to dive into a little info about a other type of card that maybe we'll see in the game, maybe we won't, but more on that later. Yeah, so at the end of our previous video, we touched on our theory of what we think the flourish or the golden swirl around the cost number at the upper left of each card might mean. And so our theory basically was that if there's no gold flourish on a character or a glimmer card, then that means you can only have one copy of that card in play on your board at a time. And that if and the same thing goes for an item. So you can only have one copy of the magic mirror on your field at a time because it does not have the flourish. And if there is no flourish around the symbol on an action card, then we were thinking that you can only play one of that action card in any given turn as well. So yes, on this page, you can see Hades, Magic Mirror, and Dragonfire do not have the flourish around the cost. And those are the only three cards revealed so far that do not have that flourish every other one does and so then we kind of thought you know what might be some reasons why the game makers would decide that you can only play one copy of a card on a turn versus um or have one copy in play versus having multiples of a character in play or playing multiples of the same action in one turn and so we kind of came up with a list of some reasons or some general rules that might apply to this situation so for characters one example could be if it's vanilla or just lacking an effect. Um, there's really nothing you know, inherently broken or too powerful about having no effect, so there'd be no reason to limit the number of vanilla characters you could have in play. Um, another thing would be characters with redundant effects. So an example of this is Captain Gantu, because as, as we know, he restricts your enemy's characters that cost two or less from engaging in challenges. Right, so if you had a second Gantu on the board at the same time as a first Gantu, I mean, they're both just applying the same effect, and it doesn't make it any harder on the opponent. They still can attack with their or challenge with their units that are cost two or lower. So they would have to remove both, however. So it does present a little additional obstacle if they do intend to try to, you know, remove Gantu and get around his effect eventually. But it doesn't, you know, ramp up the effect or change the effect that the first Gantu is already applying. So we think in that case it would be it would be fair game, but and then another another reason why uh, they might allow multiple copies of something to be played would be if the effect is you know not overly strong or is a basic keyword such as evasive or ward. You know those are keywords that many characters are going to have. Um, Challenger is another example. So just the fact that it has that keyword right. wouldn't, wouldn't make it like you know too strong because there's going to be ways to deal with with those different. Right, keywords. we're already going to know that we have to construct our decks in a way to deal with those different types of threats. So, but we're just going to go through the cards that have been revealed so far and apply the theory to each of them and see you know how well it appears to hold up so far. And, you know, it could be completely wrong. Maybe the flourish or lack thereof means something completely different. And anyone that's in the know right now could be having a, a laugh about our assumptions. But, you know, until we find out otherwise, we're just going to go with that. So, so yeah, starting with Hades, as you can see, he costs eight, does not have the flourish symbol. And he has Sinister Plot as his ability, which says he gets an extra lore for every other villain character you have in play. So... We figured that if you have multiple Hades in play, it could be a huge problem for the opponent and would really ramp up the value that he's getting beyond maybe what they have intended him to be. So just as an example, I mean, Mickey Mouse Brave Little Taylor is worth four lore, and we don't know if there's a, a cap to the number of characters you can have on board at any one time, but maybe pretending or assuming it's five then Hades would cap out at a potential of being worth five lore. Each Hades is going to buff the other Hades, and it kind of just multiplies too quickly. Right, and also he, with one of the biggest stat lines we've seen so far in the game at 6-7, there's actually only one character so far, Maleficent, that would be able to challenge him and take him out in one fight. I mean, any other unit would need you know, at least one other ally to assist, in the fight so Hades would be getting you know a two for one trade basically so if you were staring down three Hades at the same time it might just be too much for them to be able to deal with 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 characters on the board and even just 
spending, you know, a removal option on him like Maleficent to remove one. If they had a lot, it just helps them get to that win condition of collecting a lot of lore probably faster than they intend. So we do feel, however, that if he's removed from the board, you can definitely go ahead and play another Hades because I'm assuming if you build a deck around him, you're going to want to ensure that you do draw the card and see it at some point during the game. So I'm sure you can run more than one Hades in your deck, but beyond that, probably just having one on board is what we think that lack of the flourish symbol implies. Yes, and so Magic Mirror, we touched on this a bit in our last video as well, um, but you know, card draw becomes very strong in a late game scenario where people have kind of run out of cards in their hand and every turn you're just drawing maybe one normally if that's the way the rules work. But here, if you had two Magic Mirrors down, suddenly you can go from one card to three cards on that turn, and then the next turn, you know, you draw your regular card, and if you want to draw two more, you could tap your two Magic Mirrors. Right, it just gives you so many more options than your opponent would have if they were not also running Magic Mirror, and would probably not be a fun play experience for them to be sitting across from that. So that's another reason why we think they probably want to limit the card draw to curb that scenario from ever happening, even though, you know, it might be on the slower side to play multiple down and spend, you know, the four for each one to draw a card. But yeah, it's only an initial investment cost of two, so right. even if you, you know, didn't use it for a while, like, in that late game scenario that we described, it's going to pay off in the end if you're using it over multiple turns. And if you had two, you know, you would just see a lot more options than your opponent. So that could be too strong if they let you have more than one. And then Dragonfire, which we also mentioned last time, this is where, you know, playing two copies of that in one turn could really create a negative experience for the other player. And I do think, you know, being a this is a Disney game, you don't want to necessarily create negative experiences, you know, for the community and the players who are going to be trying to enjoy this game. Um, yes, there's going to be a, a very competitive side and, and players who are there just for the, you know, the competitive aspect, but then some people are just maybe more casually going to be enjoying this game and, you know, Dragonfire creates uh, some problems there potentially. Well, only in the way that perhaps you have like two really expensive or high cost units on the board and, you know, maybe you have Hades on there for eight and Maleficent for nine and then for just the low cost of, you know, 10, if they play two Dragonfires in the same turn, they've removed, you know, two huge units that you probably invested most of two turns to play down. Yep. And then, you know, didn't get to probably get the value out of them you were hoping for. So we just feel like that limiting it to one per turn seems like a good way to balance, to balance that and also to kind of force your opponent to try to develop their board instead of just removing couple of things from the opponent's board as well so we'll have to see if if that is what that implies but for now it seems like it has potential so now we're going to quickly run through the other cards that have been revealed which not all of these will have flourishes so these are cards that we believe you can have multiple copies in play at a time or play multiple copies of this action you know in one turn and so we'll kind of touch on why we think that these were allowed to be played as multiples so uh, Mickey Mouse. Uh, uh, this is an example of where his only effect is a standard keyword of evasive, which, you know, we think there will be a decent number of evasive cards in the game. There may be some actions that give characters evasive for the turn, you know, so maybe that's a way that people who aren't running evasive characters can deal with something like Mickey Mouse. Um, so, and then again, you're only pay you're paying eight and you're getting a stat line of, of five, five. So there's going to be cards that cost a lot less than Mickey Mouse that can, you know, deal five damage to him potentially. Um, so he's kind of like, he seems like a luxury card where if your game play, if your board is set up nicely, you know, he might be able to get you that four lore. Right. With, uh, you know, easier than some characters that don't have evasive. Um, I could see him being potentially you know, a problem to go against if for some reason you couldn't deal with one and then they play another and all of a sudden you can't deal with that either and, you know, they're collecting eight lore a turn or however it works. But, but yeah, I think it's it's more so... It You're probably not going to want balanced. too many of him in your hand early on in the game. So, you know, the question of how many of these you would put in your deck is is a valid question and then he's not he doesn't seem great in combat because you know for the price you're paying the stats really aren't there so right so i think it seems like he's only for the lore if really. you're behind then he probably feels expensive to play for eight costs and 
just you won't be able to probably use him to necessarily trade out very much. Or the reason you're probably playing him is to collect the four lore. So if you are behind, it will take most of your most of your uh, resources allocated per turn, assuming you're maybe capped at ten to play him. So it would just be a little slow to try to play out a bunch of Mickeys. Yeah, if you're already behind, so maybe that's why he's given a pass here and the stat line as well. So. And Mulan, I think we mentioned this in our last video as well, but when you're using Mulan in a challenge, you're not using her to quest for lore. And if you had multiple Mulans down, uh, the point of her seems to be, you know, buffing your other units when she gets a, successfully banishes a character. So if you had two Mulans and you use both of them for their effects, you know, then you're really just buffing however many other characters you have. Uh, on the board and this effect is a little harder to get off because your opponent has the option of playing around Setting up easy challenges for you. Mm -hmm. You know, they may be able to protect their characters or you know Maybe keep them unexerted which we think means they can't be directly targeted So right. there's times where Mulan's effect will not even be in play Right, so hers seems more difficult to pull off and then because she's not getting extra lore as a result of it then it seems like it's not going to ramp up maybe to the extent that multiple Hades would. So that's why we think she was fine to be left at five. And another, or at just the, you know, ability to have more than one in play. And then also maybe her cost of five could be a factor too, because, you know, if you are stuck with just a few cards left in your hand, and maybe you have 10 resources and two of your three remaining cards are both Mulan, and if you weren't allowed to play, you know, both of the cards, it be due to, you know, in-game restriction, you know, then that could really be it an unfun experience or like, yeah, really hamper your, your options. So Whereas Hades costing eight, you're probably only ever going to be play one, being able to play one in a turn anyway. So I think having seen like the majority of the cards revealed so far have the flourish, it seems like they're trying to allow you to play multiple in most scenarios. It's only going to be those, like those small scenarios where they're gonna say you know what maybe we've play tested this a lot and Hades just feels you know a little broken if you get multiple down you know I think play testing is a big thing like we can assume the game makers have done a lot of that during the development process and mm -hmm. they would know best you know through that play testing experience like what cards work better um, to be restricted versus not restricted so healing glow here's an example of an action that it really doesn't do anything negative to your opponent. It's just something that if you want to put this in your deck, you know, you can remove two damage from a character. How relevant is that going to be? You know, not sure. Um, but it certainly doesn't seem like a busted effect, and it's a very cheap cost. So, yeah, I don't I don't see why you would want to limit that to just once per turn, and it does have the flourish around the symbol. So, so far, it seems like it's checking out. Um, the wardrobe of vanilla character doesn't have any effects. So, again, no reason to limit that to just one on board now the pocket watch this was a more interesting analysis uh, we thought about this one uh, but the initial expense of three so if you're playing two of these you have to come up with six resources during probably the early to mid part of the game and then in a late game scenario we don't know how many resources you're going to be allowed to have maximum right but imagine it's 10 so then you'd be if you were trying to use two of these in one turn you'd be limited to playing let's say a character with the cost of four and then paying the one and exerting the pocket watch to rush it in and then playing one more character of four or less and then exerting the other pocket watch and paying the extra one so you know or any combination of like six and two seven right. and one but so, still it limits the the top end of the minions that you're allowed to play right your your resources that you're allocated each turn would kind of limit the amount of characters you're able to rush in so and plus rush is also not sending them on a quest for lore, which we think is the win condition. So, you know, it would maybe be a different story if you could all of a sudden send characters on quest for lore right away with this card. But since you can't, we feel like it's more balanced that way and wouldn't be like a game breaking feature to allow more than one. And we also think, um, as we touched on in the prior video, that you likely cannot challenge um, opponent's characters that aren't exerted. So there's going to be times when your opponent doesn't have any exerted characters. And, and you might those, not get any benefit from In those rushing. moments, rush wouldn't help because you wouldn't be able to rush in and challenge something. Right. So. I am curious if there will be like a quick quest ability where a character could maybe go on a quest for lore right away. But we'll have to see. So then looking at Stitch... Um, he's another interesting one being Floodborne, um, but his effect essentially is what we feel is a redundant effect. And again, we thought redundant effects 
probably are allowed to have the flourish in most cases, because here, if you were playing a character that costs two or less, you can exert them to draw a card when you have Stitch, but when you exert them, we feel that would only trigger off of one of your Stitch cards, and then, you know, it's already exerted, so you can't trigger it on the next Stitch. Right, because so no it matter, can only be exerted the one time. So no matter how many Stitches you have, we feel like you're going to draw one card off of this effect uh, one time whenever you play a two cost or less and so having two stitches doesn't doesn't help you in any additional way right and now moana we don't have any details about her elsa also has the flourish and you know she has a pretty good effect but however we felt that with elsa's effect she's exerting herself to exert an opponent's character however she's not engaging in combat and she's not questing for lore so you're basically like not using her except to exert an opposing character so if you had four elsas you know is it really getting you anywhere to spend your entire turn exerting four of their characters when those four characters are just going to unexert you know on on the opponent's turn well we're assuming they will anyway. and that yeah that's the assumption so in that in that case she's definitely a powerful control piece but for every elsa that's taking up a slot on your board you know that's if you're using her effect, you're not really going towards your win condition. Um, so we feel like that makes sense then to allow you know the player to have as many Elsas as, as they can get on the field. And then Olaf, of course, is vanilla, and that's another category that we feel just deserves the flourish. And then this Mickey card does not have any details yet either. And Maleficent, we feel with her... It costs nine, so again, that's going to be, assuming you're capped at ten resources a turn, that would take most of your turn to play her out. And then once she's used her ability, then she's basically sitting on board with just her stats and two lore. So if you invest nine, you know, that's a pretty big investment, and then you get your ability once, but it's not like breaking the game or, or you know getting ramping out of control like multiple hades might so. yeah this was another rule we kind of thought about is most on play effects where they don't have a persistent effect that lasts after they're played uh, most of them are probably fair game to have multiple copies on the field at once because once she's on the field she doesn't do anything special she's too low she's seven five but that's it you amazing know, there's, stats but... there's no negative effect on the opponent after she's in play so that's another reason why we feel like you can have multiple copies of Maleficent. And then this Aladdin is the next one we haven't touched on yet, but there are no details there. So, so now let's bring up the other colors we haven't looked at. We'll add Sapphire, Emerald, and Steel. So we just passed the uh, Emerald a little bit ago. Yep, there's, oh, right. there's Cruella. So most low cost, you know, characters we think will be allowed to play multiple because you're going to want to see these early in the game. Right. And if you've got multiple in your hand, it would feel very limiting to not be allowed to play them, especially if they're not game breaking abilities. But... Also at a low cost, most characters effects are probably deemed to be not that critical to the game since you can get her in play for only two cost. And her stat line, of course, is a one three. Many characters will be able to deal with you know, with her stats. Her, she does have a good effect, though. Her effect's but... annoying, but yeah, really no reason to limit the number of Corellas you could have. Jumba as well, another vanilla character, no ability, so makes sense that he is not limited. And Aladdin, here's another example of one that just has a basic keyword, and he's a low cost and low stats, so no reason to limit you there. Now, Aurora was interesting. Yeah, she I, actually, I think, is the most interesting character here that has a flourish. I think there could be an argument to say uh, it might be okay if she didn't have one um, because imagine a late game scenario where you've got, let's say three, um, you've got Scar and Robin Hood and let's say Maleficent down and then you've got two Auroras. So the, as soon as you have two Auroras, everything on your board has ward because each Aurora gives all other characters ward. And so now they can't use any on play effects or actions or you know abilities against your entire board, essentially. You've, you've developed immunity across your entire character. Right, line. so now they're either required to challenge the units they really want to take out, or if they don't have the power to do that with their 
their units on board, they'll have to instead challenge both auroras and take both auroras out before they could maybe use their removal actions or you know on play effects out of other characters to target the bigger threats on the board so having two auroras it just makes it interesting like you also aren't allowed then to use any of that removal or abilities on any of the auroras either because normally she only grants ward to your allies but if if there were two and they're giving ward to themselves yeah it could create an interesting scenario but but then again we thought how ward really only prevents against effects and as you're playing cards uh, your opponent is going to be playing cards and they're going to be building their deck in a way where they can get you know some good combat to happen so it's it's I feel like it's unlikely that your board is going to go so unchallenged that you're going to get to a point where, where you're going to have two auras out, yeah. and a bunch of other like value characters in play. You know, they'll just have to, as the game is going on, try to deal with you know the first aurora before you know additional ones pop out. And and her stats aren't you know incredible because I think with her good the effects that she has, other characters without effects are, are going to have. Um, higher stats to, or different offensive effects to kind of deal with things like this. Yeah, so there should be units that the opponent can develop while you're developing the Aurora to challenge her and maybe remove that threat. But, you know, for the most part, if you did have two, it would be a mostly redundant ability except for the Auroras granting each other the yep. ward as well. So it could create some some strange, you know, frustrating scenarios if, if the opponent didn't have a way to challenge Aurora and get her off the board. But... For the most part, it, it seems like it would be less threatening and less likely to create like a kind of a game ending experience, I guess, than some of the other cards that do not have the flourish. Yeah, and I think the way her effect works, it, it makes the opponent target the initial one kind of with abilities if they can, because they can't target anything else. So she almost like puts a target on herself and she'll probably be um, removed, you know, relatively quickly after she comes down if right. opponents are worried about her effect lingering. So so that's kind of why we think like there's definitely the potential for, for her to get out of hand in a in a really crazy setup. Um, but most of the time, probably through playtesting, they maybe decided that that doesn't happen very often or is, is hard to achieve. So Yeah, I think it's totally fine how it is. And then we and we've got Robin Hood and he's another example of um, other than his evasive that he gains, which again is kind of a static keyword, then he does have an on play effect, which may or may not trigger. Um, but once the on play effect happens, he just sits there as a 4 4, you know, for six costs with really no negative impact on the opponent. So, really, no reason why you'd want to limit the number of Robin Hoods you could play. And Scar, again, is another on play effect. You know, it happens one time. And then he sits there as a 5-4 stat line, which isn't overly impressive for a 6 cost. Yep, and Captain Hook, I mean, I assume if you're running him, you're probably running multiple copies to try to hope to, you know, open the game with him on your board. And so... So you probably want to see a lot of him early. Yeah, if you have two in your hand and you have the resources for it, it, it would feel weird to be capped at that. And, you know, he's got a... a good effect it could be a little bit controlly in the early game but again it's but a nothing, basic keyword and low cost low stats right, nothing so crazy all so. reasons we think there's a flourish there gantu we talked about him a little bit earlier but he has a redundant effect since you know an additional gantu doesn't do anything extra um, it would make it a little more annoying for the opponent to try to get through two before they can use their two cost but again he's eight cost and at the time that you're spending eight your opponent is likely developed or developing their bigger minions as well and not relying on their two cost minions anymore. So, you know, there's times where we're at not as heavily as they were. So, you know, Gantu just doesn't seem like something you could only have one of. And then Tinkerbell, uh, we, we thought with her that she lets you cycle a card, but you're not going up a card essentially. You know, you're right. just swapping a card. So because she's not generating you additional hand size um it's really not a negative impact to the opponent too much whereas if she was drawing you an extra card every turn then mm -hmm. we feel like this would be like magic mirror it would be kind of crazy to have like three of her down she'd be a lot cheaper than the mirror exert you know, all three wise. and like draw three cards for free right like, she does have pretty good stats for her cost so you know it might take them to use a couple of their creatures to or units to challenge her and take her out so yeah i mean she seems good but i do think limiting it to just one 
it doesn't seem necessary with her and um, yeah it's kind of it's random what you're gonna get when you use her effect you know you can't it's definitely improving your hand or it, it's likely to be if you're choosing a good card to discard and looking for something else getting through your deck faster always great but but then you're not you're also not going for lore and you're not doing combat when you do her ability so right. it's you're taking a random chance that the card you draw is going to be better than the one you send back and that that's just not always going to happen right so, so if you are developing like multiple of her then you're probably just falling behind on the board in a way because you could probably be playing more expensive units as it progresses and then yeah, so it doesn't seem like that would need to be limited to one either. So yeah, in summary, like some reasons for having no flourish would be, um, or no, reasons for having a flourish would be that it's like a vanilla character, so it doesn't have an effect, or it has a redundant effect, or it has an on-play effect, but no persistent negative impact on the opponent. Or it just doesn't seem like it would really or, kind of break the game or you know progress someone toward that win condition quicker than intended and then one other thing i thought of too is for action cards depending on how many resources we're allowed to have let's say the max is 10 then any action card that costs you know six six or higher they might just if there's no way to gain additional resources during your turn just by default something that's like six or higher you wouldn't be able to play more than more than one just because of the cost so in, in those cases, they wouldn't even have to, you know, debate if it should have the flourish or not. It just would have it since you can only afford to play one in a turn. But then again, we don't know if there's going to be cards that let you gain resources after you've spent, you know, resources. And maybe you could do that at, at some point. But so, yeah, this was just kind of our uh, evaluation um, of the flourish versus no flourish based on kind of what we're assuming and again this could be totally wrong right. so we're, we're very excited to hear uh, from the game makers the rules when it finally does come out and get some more clarification on this and that is supposed to be coming in spring so it's 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 coming up soon but yeah i feel i feel decently confident about this especially since you know most cards do have the flourish and i think from a development standpoint you probably don't want to limit too many cards in that way so people can Play yeah. the cards they draw. You want to be able to play what's in your hand most of the time. And yeah, you don't want to get a clunky hand where you've got multiple copies of something that you can't use. But again, if I guess if, if that does turn out to be what the symbol or, or lack of its presence means, then you know that might influence how people build their decks so that they don't get stuck with you know too many in their hand yep. that they can't use. So, but yeah, now we thought we'd explore the possibility of a different type of card that is yet to be revealed, and. First, though, we're going to take a look at this product right here, Disney Villainous, which is very produced. Fun game. Yes, very fun. Produced by Robinsberger, who is also making Disney Lorcana. And we've been big fans of Villainous for a long time. And so when we heard that Robinsberger was behind Lorcana, we knew it's in great hands. They made the Villainous games with incredible quality and attention to detail and you know featuring a lot of the disney villains and heroes that we are all very familiar with and just created a very fun tabletop experience there so we're excited to see what they've got in store for lorcana and again it's looking amazing so far but their game uh, features cards called conditions the villainous and so we'll bring one of those up here to show you yes now conditions are cards that you can only play during your opponent's turn so if the condition on the card is met, then you can play this card in response to that condition being met, and then you get the benefits of the effect on the card. Right, so it's a bit of a surprise to the opponent. So, for example, this one, Cowardice, during their turn, if another player has three or more allies in their realm, you may play Cowardice. Play an ally from your hand for free. So obviously these, this is balanced for the villainous game, and were it to be applied in a similar fashion to Lorcana, maybe it would be called a reaction card to kind of go along with the theme of the action cards that are in the Lorcana game. But of course it would be balanced more toward Lorcana, so whether or not this effect would be similar or different, you know, would remain to be seen. But Yeah, they could call them like reactions, you know, counters, triggers, things like that. Something that that you can play in response. Uh, to your opponent doing something right so i'm not sure if this would translate well to lorcana or not but you know the potential would be there it would just require you to have this card in hand and an ally card in your hand and then your opponent 
would have to play into whatever condition was needing to be met. So, you know, whether or not it would prove to be a good card you'd want to include in a top tier deck, I guess would remain to be seen. But, you know, it's a cool example of, of an idea that, that they could, you know, build off of for Lorcana. And we have another example here, Greed. And this says, during their turn, if another player has six or more power, you may play Greed, gain three power. So for this card, we thought maybe for Lorcana, it could be reworded so that maybe during their turn, if another player gains three or more lore, you may play this card and then you gain one lore or two lore or however it would be balanced in Lorcana based on how much lore you need to win, what they thought would be fair. But, you know, that would be like a surprise mechanic too, where your opponent feels good about getting their lore and then all of a sudden maybe not so good because they're giving you some kind of free of charge so not sure if that would be too strong in yeah. arcana or not i don't think we're going to necessarily see any direct you know no i wouldn't translations that. from that game to this game but we just kind of wanted to point these out because they could certainly create conditions or scenarios in Lorcana that are balanced you know to the Lorcana experience and, and make triggers that make sense, you know, that you can try to play around or right. benefit off of. It would add, like, another layer of strategy and depth and things you'd have to consider as you're taking your turn, like what your opponent might be able to do or react to. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I like being able to just look on board and see what I'm dealing with and not have to worry about that. But, you know, if, if there were cards like this included in the game, it could be a fun twist as well, so... Yeah, some people like the idea of you being able to interact with your opponent when it's not your turn, you know, So because that does add more strategy to it, and sometimes it's nice to feel like you can play some defense when you're not in control of the turn as well. Um, so that's that's kind of one reason why cards like this exist in, in certain games. Um, but yeah, they're, not everyone's a fan of, of the, these types of cards, and I am curious to see if it's something they decide to put in their game, but... But yeah, I think this is a very cool card in Villainous, and the art is very nice as well. And now we'll look at one card from an expansion of Villainous, and this is the Despicable Plots expansion featuring Gaston, as you can see on the cover. And it's only moments away from victory. And it says during their turn, if another player plays an item, you may play this card and then play an item from your hand for zero cost. So that could be a powerful effect as well. And, you know, who knows what the items will top out at in terms of cost in Lorcana. But, you know, it could so be... So far it's the highest one, like three, I think, the White, White Rabbit's Pocket Watch. So... I think that would be fair here because, um, you know, for three cost, if you're holding this card in your hand with the sole purpose of playing another card for free, then, you know, you're using two cards basically just to play one. Right, so, so you're kind of depleting your hand a bit, and if you're only drawing one card per turn, we're not sure how the rules are yet. But, but then again, if there's, if there's if items might... that cost like eight because they're very, very strong, then I think a card like this just wouldn't exist in the same way. It might say play an item at a reduced cost of like two less or three less. Sure. You know, whatever they think is fair and more common. This is just a potential example. Yep, just a fun idea to, to bring up and, and show you if you're not familiar with villainous that there are condition cards and again yeah maybe they could be called reactions or just like fast actions or something to play off the action card in Lorcana. but and then yeah something i thought was important also to note is so in villainous these these scenarios are very specifically worded um however in a game like Lorcana, when you're building a deck you probably want to build a deck that's very versatile and can can help you out in many different scenarios so I kind of feel like if they're going to make conditions or reaction cards in Lorcana, it's probably going to be more generic things that you're re responding to or reacting to. So an example could be, you know, if your opponent challenges one of your exerted characters, you could play your condition card from your hand and then reduce the strength of your opponent's attacking character by two. So you could like surprise, keep your character alive if they maybe thought they were going to trade it out. Or some other examples would be like if they play an action card, maybe you have a card that cancels the action they played, or maybe you have a card that when they exert one of their characters to trigger an ability, you can cancel the triggered ability and their card remains exerted. So these are just you know some potential ideas. Also, right. an idea would be if 
you know, if one of your characters is banished, you could react with a condition card and, and it goes to your hand instead, you know, as a surprise. So that would be a good way to get back some of your on play effects. Yeah. So there's so much they could do with that, really. Right. And, you know, if none of that happens, that's completely fine with me. I, you know, sometimes being surprised in that way doesn't feel good in a game. And, yes. you know, what if you're challenging a unit and you know that you have the power to take it out, if all of a sudden you didn't, you know, and maybe your unit got taken out and theirs did not, um, yeah, that, that might not feel good. And maybe that wouldn't be very balanced in Larkana. We, we don't know because we don't know all the rules yet. But, you know, either way, it's just an interesting thing to consider that might be in the game. We'll just yeah. have to wait and find out. So as we close this video, uh, we thought if there's any, like, reaction cards or conditions or triggers that you could think of that you, you'd like to see in Lorcana if they do put this in, or if you don't want to see triggers at all, you know, Please feel free to, to indicate, you know, why you don't like triggers in games. Yeah, wh whatever direction they decide to go should be fun, and we're just really excited for the game. But yeah, let us know in the comments what you think, and until then, we'll see you in the next video. Yep, thanks for watching.